It's 4 o'clock on a Thursday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hour. Yeah, baby. Let's fire it up. Quarantinis are back. How are you guys? Good to see you. Today, we're going to talk about how you define success in the music industry. I was thinking about that over the weekend. And uh, actually, I was on a plane ride home the other day and thinking about that. It's like, not everybody's got the same definition of success. So maybe as a company like Taxi, we should understand the broader picture. So that's what we're going to talk about. Let us say hello to the folks in the chat room. We've got Melinda Neal, Marion Laird, John Pearson, Heidi Owen, Dan Weber, Elliot, Il Rosso Emil, Michael Lehman, Dan Weber, I think I said that already, <laughs> Rossi Jane, Lo-Fi et al., uh, Nancy Collel, thank you for the note. I'm looking over there. No, the camera's there. Thank you for the note, Nancy. It's very sweet. Martin Gravel, Pierre Venio, Stuart McClellan, Greetings all, he says, as opposed to greetings for some of you. Anyway, um, good to be back in sunny Southern California, although it is anything but sunny. Um, it is raining again. It rained yesterday. We had like a 24-hour rain, which we really needed out here. People whine about it and complain about it, but look, we need the rain. We're still in drought conditions. And it was freezing cold. It got down to 39 degrees or 34 degrees or something. And <laughs> people are freaking out. Oh, man. Um, what else do I want to tell you about that? So anyway, this morning it was all sunny. Um, and I thought, you know, I'm going to roll the awning back out. We've got about a 20-foot wide awning that extends out over part of the patio in the backyard. thought I would crank that baby out and let some of that uh, rainwater evaporate with the warm sun. Guess what? It's raining again right now, which means I've probably got, you know, gallons and gallons of water sitting on that awning, and I have a funny feeling I'm going to come home and find that awning laying on the patio. <sighs> it's been what, you know, 2021 is one of those years where it's just like write another check to fix something on the house. I'm sure all of you homeowners out there have had that experience. Right before I left town, I had to uh, replace a water heater. And wow, water heaters are expensive. Wow, everything is expensive right now. I can't believe it. I went to the grocery store after I got back to town and was absolutely shocked by how much it cost me for three not very full bags of groceries. Uh, it's crazy. Just things that I buy all the time, like vitamin water, which is normally, I get, on a good day, I get vitamin water for 88 cents a bottle. On a bad day, uh, a decent day, a dollar a bottle. On a bad day, a buck 29. It was a buck 59 a bottle. And that was at the inexpensive grocery store, not the fancy one that I won't shop at. Hello, Andre Stepani, and how are you? And Lamar, Beth D, good to see all you guys. Um, Massive inflation. Yes, plenty of inflation going around, ain't it? So let's talk about that. Should we kill a couple more minutes and let the room fill up so we can get more opinions? I think it's going to take a little while to regain the taxi quarantini audience because we've been on a break for a month. Um, you notice I still haven't renamed it. It's still called the quarantini. I didn't get a lot of uh, thumbs up. Uh, when I, What was the last name I pitched out there was something like uh, Taxi Members Only Club or something like that. Say, like, hey, what if I'm not a member? We're not going to check your green card at the door, uh, as opposed to some other places that are actually doing that. Now, uh, when I was over in Israel, um, it was funny. That they're pretty strict over there. Um, I... I yeah, people in America keep saying, oh, you're going to Israel. Aren't they really strict over there? And they are. And, you know, to get in the country, you've got to jump through a lot of hoops. You've got to get tested three days before you fly. You have to register with the Ministry of Health. You have to take a COVID test when you land at the airport and then quarantine yourself till you get the results of that test, which honestly came like six hours after I got it. So no big deal there. I was sleeping when I got the results. Um and then you get, uh, if you fill out all the paperwork properly, one of the things was a seven-page form. That was not fun. I don't do well with forms. I, I think I flunked the SATs just because I couldn't fill out the little 
little round dots properly. I'm just bad with forms. Anyway, uh, so you go through, you jump through all these hoops, and then you get this thing on your phone that's called a green pass. There's a word in Hebrew for it, which I'll never be able to pronounce, so I'm not going to try. And uh, I'm like, wow, glad I got that, because now I can go anywhere. I can go to any restaurant, go to any mall, go to any store. And the first three days I was there, they, hey, can I see your green pass? And uh, by the middle of the trip, it's like, do you have a green pass? Yes, I do. Oh, that's okay. We don't need to see it. We believe you. So they just let anybody in. By the end of the trip, it was like, green what? <laughs> oh, man. Marion Laird started a novel in 2020 set in the pandemic. Well, it's still current news, Marion. You're in luck there. Now I need to make a proper timeline so I go, don't get my facts wrong. Well, why should you get your facts right? Nobody else seems to anymore. <laughs> Uh, why, why must you rename the Quarantini? Well, the Quarantini um, was named because we we're in quarantine, remember? Uh, what was that? What were we told? Uh, uh, flatten the curve. That was it. Don't go to work or outside or breathe any air for two weeks because we're going to flatten the curve. How'd that work? <laughs> Oh, man. Anyway, uh, so, yeah, I don't know. Um, it, it's, I will say comparatively uh, comparing or contrasting the U.S. and Israel right now, and I'm only bringing this up because people keep asking me, having just gotten back from there. Um, the people in the media over there seem less panic stricken about it like they're not like oh my god there's a new variant there's definitely a difference in the way that the media in each of the countries report stuff um people in general over there seem much more compliant with government regulations though than americans and there's no divide i i mentioned this to a couple of friends since i got back that it was and it's not the first time i think it's like the 15th time i've been there but i noticed there's just there's no divide, even though there is. There are political divides, I'm sure. There are religious divides, I'm sure. But I routinely saw, um, like, you know, 14-year-old kids where it was like one kid was um, Ethiopian, another kid was Middle Eastern and Israeli looking, another kid was like Eastern European, Jewish uh, slash Israeli, and another kid uh, looked Arabic, and they were all hanging out together outside of a 7-Eleven smoking cigarettes, just like America. Um, and I saw little kids, same thing. I, I mean, there really is, like, there's no, not even a discussion about racism over there. It's so funny. Um, so I thought that was kind of refreshing to see. And the same thing with COVID, where over here it's pushed much more in the media, like, oh, my God, there's this thing called Omicron. Uh, and, and, but meanwhile, I don't know, maybe I'm watching different media, but they're basically saying it's maybe more contagious, but... Um, basically, it's a cough. <laughs> so maybe I've got it. I don't know. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, let's see. I'm reading the chat room for those of you who don't know that. Yeah, food prices. Wow, wow, wow. Um, what else did I see the other? Oh, I stopped at Trader Joe's yesterday on my way home from work. Or no, during the workday, I ran over to Trader Joe's and I bought a bag of tangerines. I ate tangerines pretty much every day of my life. I love seedless tangerines that peel easily. I'm a little bit of an expert on the subject. I know all the different varieties. Pride myself on my tangerine knowledge base. Um, yeah, if they had like Jeopardy for tangerine eaters, I could go on that show. I really could. I, I could be a champion. Um, anyway, uh, they had a bag of tangerines. I think it was six ninety nine, and there were six tangerines in there. They were medium-sized tangerines, but still. Uh, little kids don't smoke over there. It's like the 14-year-olds. <laughs> they smoke. It's like America. You know? What do you do when you're 14? You buy a skateboard, buy a pack of Marlboros. Uh, actually, you get a grown-up to buy you a pack of Marlboros at 7-Eleven, and then you lean up against the dumpster with your skateboard, and you chain smoke, right? <sighs> yep, mandarin satsumas. I've, I planted a satsuma tree in my backyard a few years ago. It's not growing very quickly. Um, did the Trader Joe coffee, chocolate-covered coffee beans go up? I don't know, but I bought some yesterday. I just didn't bother to look at the price. 
Hellman's Mayo, $7. What's up with that? Holy crap. Are you kidding me, Andre? You're talking about the jar that's like that big, is $7? Or are you talking about the Costco size? It's like a paint can. Tangerine season in Tokyo. Woo, must go to Tokyo. <laughs> they jumped a Greek letter to name the new variant because it's too hard to pronounce. I think a lot of people are having trouble with Omicron. Some call it Omicron, some call it Omnicron, some call it Omicron. Who the hell knows? 14-year-olds need to buy a guitar. There you go. And probably sell it for crack or something. I don't know. These kids today, I tell you. Wow, it used to be four ninety nine. Anyway, um, so I think everybody's here that's going to show up today. So let's talk about that. So I'm really curious. You know, speaking of divides, there there are different types of taxi members, not different classes, but certainly different types. For some of you, um, you're a singer songwriter, uh, or you're a songwriter, and you want to pitch your stuff to major record labels, or at least artists that are on major labels. Some of you might be in a band or a solo artist and you're desirous of getting a record deal. Other people are primarily instrumental composers, but amongst the instrumental composers, we've got people that would love to do big, epic trailer orchestrals, you know, like really, really big. <laughs> uh, other people that love doing dramedy cues that, you know, um, puppies can roll downstairs to or something. So I'm always trying to think of ways to make taxi better for everybody, and I always come to the same conclusion, which is there are very few ideas that I can come up with that make taxi better for everybody other than taxi TV and the quarantinis. Um, so I want to know more about, not your goals. We can talk about goals later. Maybe we'll move into talking about New Year's resolutions because lying to ourselves is fun, right? <laughs> I'm going to lose five pounds in 2022. And that's, hold on, that's why I polished off this over the last two days. Trader Joe's English toffee. Yep, five pounds. Not going to happen. But that's why I'm eating it now, because in 2022, I'm going to lose those five pounds. Um, that would only be if I got bit on the butt by a shark or something. He took a five-pound chunk out of my ass. <laughs> Oh, man. Um, Israel's music is very beautiful. Um, and, and it's funny, just like America and pretty much everywhere else in the world uh, it comes in all varieties. You know, you get the beautiful singer-songwriters that make these lush, beautiful singer-songwriter songs, and then you get the hip-hop guys. I heard several tunes. Uh, my daughters that live over there both speak fluent Hebrew, and we'd be in the car, and I'd hear a song go, well, hold on a minute, that's Arabic and Hebrew. And so rappers um, doing like back and forth rapping with each other uh, and doing it in both languages. And you routinely apparently hear that on radio. Like <laughs> I said, radio, one of my kids, my 21 year old goes, dad, come on. Like nobody listens to radio. But the funny thing is every time she was playing her playlist from the back seat of the car through Bluetooth into the car radio. And I'd say, who's that? I don't know. Uh, you're listening to me. She, the song would come on. She go, I love this song. Who is it? I don't know. So not only have we moved past not looking at the album cover. Do I have one nearby? I do not. Um, we no longer look at the album cover. Um, this is going to break a lot of hearts because I know you guys are not unlike me in this regard. They don't read credits. They don't care who engineered the record. They don't care who mixed it. They don't care who produced it. They don't even care who the artist is, but they know every friggin' word to the song. Um, even when somebody my age can't even discern what those words are. Excuse me a moment. I think I either have a sneeze coming or I need to blow my nose. I'll be right back. There we go. Woo. Much better. Uh, I can never tell when someone is speaking Canadian until they start swearing in French. There you go. I once co-wrote a song and the lyric it was, a, what was it called? The Devil Speaks in French. It's about a friend of mine whose girlfriend cheated on him and she was French. 
I do, I miss album cover notes too. I used to be a fanatical reader of album cover notes, um, lyrics on the sleeves, all that stuff. Nothing better than when a live album came out and you got to read the studio credits. I remember that was the first time I saw um, one of the most famous live recording engineers, a guy named Guy Charbonneau that I think worked in the record plant, uh, West Coast record plant remote truck all the time. But I think he was actually French Canadian. I think he pronounced his name Guy Charbonneau. Um, Marion sneezed twice. <laughs> I just sneezed twice before you almost did. Well, there you go. We're twins, Marion. That was not a finger. That was supposed to be <laughs> fingers crossed like twins, you know. <laughs> didn't look that way on camera unfortunately <laughs> all right so who wants to lead off here um just start putting stuff in and i'll just read it out loud uh how do you how do you define success for some people it's as simple as just having anything on tv getting my music out there that that's the most common thing i hear is just getting my music out there and i just want to bonk people on the head and go what the hell uh what do you mean just get it out there. What does that mean? Does that mean put it on a boom box, put it on top of a car in a parking lot, your music is out there? Uh, does it mean millions of people will hear it on a radio? Does it mean you get it in a TV show? What does out there mean? Elliot says, pay your bills. I like the way you think, Elliot. There's a man that's got a good, precise definition. Um, we both do have the initials ML. Okay, pay the bills. It's funny sometimes when I talk about the money, ask, you know, earning money, doing what you love, and people say to me, it's not about the money, it's about the art. It's like, do they have to be mutually exclusive? Melinda Neal defines success as Italian food. <laughs> uh, Ken Messert, I want to get it out there. Oh, come on, Ken. You're smarter than that, dude. Give me something and it's got some meat to it. Landing a song on a consistently watched, viewed placement. Landing a song on a consistently watched, viewed placement. You mean, you know, getting a song on a big TV show that everybody watches? Or are you talking about a placement like, you know, a theme song or something that's seen every week? Can you give me a little more clarity on that? Heidi Owen wants to become a one-hit wonder. There's a woman that's got some focus. I like it comfortably pay the bills with music. Interesting. John Pearson says, success for me equals having a song I feel really strongly about get the same strong attention from a publisher. All right, so can I translate that a little bit to I'm good enough at my craft now that I know when I've written a winner because other people who matter validate it for me, yay, I'm succeeding? And I'm not saying that facetiously. I, I, I understand and I agree with you. So creating A-plus work. make a living out of it. I'm really surprised. I completely concur. I, I think that that's a worthy goal because if you're making a living out of it, that means you're creating music that's good enough that people are willing to pay for it. So that's good. Oh, Ken's, Ken's now recanted or, or modified his statement a little bit out there where people pay for music. There you go. Six Mojo, oh, that one scrolled off the page. Success is having more guitars than you can play at once. <laughs> I like it. Get to the point you're no longer hungry for success and the music quality is again the thing in focus. I like that. So I'm gonna put that under creating A plus work as well. Oh, that's right. Monday. I forgot about that. I, I know I told Bree and Liz, but I personally forgot. 
So Monday show, just as a reminder for you kids who weren't here last week for Monday show, this coming Monday show, uh, we're doing, just for fun, having you guys submit songs that are piano vocal only and guitar vocal only. If you put a shaker in there, I'm not going to disqualify you. Uh, but no other instrumentation. Keep it really stripped down, you know, like, uh, yeah, guitar, vocal, piano, vocal of original Christmas songs. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to hang out, maybe have a little eggnog, get a little nauseous because it's just so rich, um, and uh, have like a little Christmas party listening to original Christmas music in its most stripped down form. Having Bob Gunnerfeld says, having people enjoy the music I created. So how can I... Um, that's kind of like getting it out there, but that's the, the benefit of getting it out there. So people enjoying your music. Uh, Getting up and doing what you love to do instead of dreading doing the same job you dislike. Okay, um, I guess that's got to fall under pay the bills, though, because if music pays the bills, then you get to get up and do what you love doing, right? When is the deadline for the song challenge? Well, it's not a challenge. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'll give away a hoodie. You know, maybe that would be the cool thing to do. Maybe you all cast a vote and give away a hoodie or something on the show. Um... So the deadline, we haven't come up with an official deadline, but it'll be sometime around noon on Monday. And you need to provide us with a link that w where we can stream it and then download it as well. Sometimes people just said the download link, that means we have to download it um, in order to hear it. But I guess we're not picking, you know, anything. So it doesn't matter. Everything that gets submitted, uh, we'll pick randomly, you know, I'll like put names in a hat. We'll pick them randomly because I don't think we'll get through all of them. Who knows? Um, I want to make sure that nobody's upset and feels like they got overlooked. So that's what we will do is put names in a hat or do this on a list and bink. Um, I've done the things, heard my song on the radio, been on TV, was in a music video, almost scored a film, <laughs> uh, scored the trailer. Mary and Laird, you've already lost? What kind of attitude is that? Snap out of it, lady. <laughs> uh, do you need lyrics? You know what? That would be nice. Why not? Usually there's some month left at the end of the money. I like that. Having another singer-songwriter ask if they can cover one of your songs. There you go. I like that one. Oh, I know. Uh, having another artist cover one of your songs. Is it better to get a talent agent to push my music? Yeah, honestly, talent agent, um, they don't have connections. You need somebody who's actually in the music industry. A talent agent is like gets a comedian a, a gig or an actor a job. They really don't handle music much. Um, Ken Mesford wants to wake up every day, make music in my studio, which I work stupid hard for, and make so much money that I can buy gear I don't even need. Speaking of gear I don't even need, hang on, I'm going to show you some of that. Okay, so once again, my resolution for 2022 is I'm actually going to use the logic that I've got on my computer. Uh, and I've done, you know, a bunch of little mixing stuff on it and played around with a lot of uh, plugins that I think are really cool and they actually work and they sound good. 
But then I thought, what if I actually wanted to record a vocal or a guitar? Why, well, I would need an interface for that. And I was thinking about getting the focus right. For like three years, I'm thinking about the focus right because nobody ever says anything bad about it. People always say good stuff about it. It's really inexpensive. Um, and I can't see dropping a thousand bucks on a really like sexy, gorgeous sounding universal audio thing that's like $989. But then I heard about this. This is the Universal Audio Volt. Uh, and this one is actually the Volt 276. So here's the interesting thing about this is it's got two ins and two outs. And it's got a Universal 610 preamp on each side to give it that classic sound. If you want it, you press a button and it sounds like a classic. Um, or uh and or it's got an 1176 in here as well 1176 limiter compressor that is probably the most commonly used compressor in the world of hardware anyway at least back in my day everybody used 1176s on everything except me not me i was never a huge fan i liked it it was utilitarian and there were some things that it did sound really good on but i always had better luck with la3s so anyway, um, yeah, so I saw this thing and it wasn't that much money and it's made by Universal and uh, hold on, I'm going to try and get it open without ripping the box apart. Yeah, I've been drooling about the Apollos for a long time, but you know me, I, I mean, I'm I'm not even a hobbyist at this point. I'm just a guy who's got logic on his computer that used to know his way around a studio. But I fear, what the hell? For that rare day where I call up Shirelli and say, Rob, come on over. I need a bass part on something. Don't bring your Hoffner. <laughs> Man. So there it is. Uh, it's really, really, I think it was uh, under 300 bucks, maybe it's like 200 bucks. I don't remember. I ordered a long time ago. It took forever to get here because of the shipping crisis or whatever they call it. Um, anyway, so it's got MIDI in, MIDI out, which I'm guessing I haven't read anything about it really. I saw a couple of reviews before I ordered it, so I didn't order it totally blind, but it's got monitor. There's the back panel. And I'm guessing that the MIDI in, MIDI out is so that if you want to make uh, something programmable, um, like have the 1176 kick in at a certain point or something like that. Anyway, so you can press these little guys. I should plug it in and light it up, but I'm afraid to blow up my beautiful broadcast studio. Um, it does have phantom power. Um, and yes, it's got... Um, quarter inch jacks and it's got XLRs those I don't even know what you call those those weren't around back in my day um, Mary says that's adorable Marion it's not a guinea pig or a, a, a kitty cat or a puppy you don't call audio gear adorable Marion bad bad Marion <laughs> anyway um, it's it's heavy it's really really solid um, I know Universal Audio builds great stuff. I've never used any of their products that I didn't love, with the exception of the 1176. I, I liked it. I didn't love it. Um, that's about it. It's got a headphone out, gain for each channel. Um, you press that button right there. It says Vintage, and it kicks in the uh, 610 preamp circuitry. Um, and then you kick in the other button that says 76 and it kicks in the 1176 and then it's got like a stepped button where you can do a vocal setting on the limiter, a guitar setting, um, fast attack and off. Um, yeah, it's got monitors, doesn't it? Yeah, it's got monitors right there. Whoops. There you go. Um, so I'm anxious to use it. But I have responsibilities, namely taxi stuff that I must get done before I get to play with it. And from the way the weekend is shaping up, I might not even get to play with it this weekend. Who knows? Um, 
There we go. Stay there. So that's that. I don't even know if there is an app for that thing. I honestly don't know. <laughs> Will I let you say cute? Sexy. You can call it sexy, Marion. Audio gear is sexy. Whether you're a man or a woman, you look at it and you go, ooh, that's sexy. Um, yeah, I probably will be too busy pushing uh, water off the awning this weekend if the awning is still even mounted to the outside of the house. Yeah, it's only got two monitor outs. You can buy a, a, a one-in, one-out version, two-in, two-out, and a four-in, four-out. And you can buy a version of it that doesn't have the 1176 built in, I think. Um, I'm pretty sure that there's a version that doesn't have the 1176. Okay, so, um, oh, while we're on the subject, uh, I, I was hanging out with Tom last night because he and I like talking audio gear every now and then. And... I was talking about the 1176 option on the interface and the fact that it had the fast button, um, which means fast attack for those of you who are not aficionados of compressors or limiters. Uh, I'm curious to see that if you were throwing a compressor on a kick drum or a snare drum, would you opt for fast attack or slow attack? Type it in that chat room. I'm only asking out of curiosity. Yeah, you can leave in the shaker. All right, keep those answers coming. All right, Elliot, you are a very smart person. Back in my day, I, I worked with like some of the best engineers literally in the country, if not the world. And I was shocked sometimes that, I mean, it was just common knowledge. It's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna use the 1176. It's got a really fast attack. And they would set the thing to the fastest attack. Um, but one day on my own, a couple of years after I left Criteria and I was working, can't remember, somebody relatively famous doing an album for them. And I just decided to be contrary to what I thought was the right way to do it. And I didn't go for the fast attack. It was either a kick drum, a snare drum, or a snare drum, probably a snare drum. And I realized Yes, it sounds like crap. When you put a, a compressor on fast attack and run a snare, you would think because it's got really spiky transients, you know, it's like really fast. So you got to have something that grabs it right away and squishes it down. But that's what happens is it does exactly that. So it takes the robustness. It takes the dynamics. It doesn't just compress it to keep it, you know, or limit to keep it from going into the red it actually just squashes the whole thing down because it grabs it right away. So try this. If you, for those of you who beg to differ or use the opposite approach, go for a slower attack. Go for like what, whatever. If it's like, you know, one to 10 or zero to 10, go for like a seven or an eight on the attack for speed. Um, I don't even know what that would be in milliseconds. Depends on the compressor. And then you will find that you get that big, beautiful sound of the shell, the whole drum, and then the compressor kicks in. So Elliot, you got it 100% right. Yay, I'm very, very proud of you, Elliot. API channel I just got, I think the demo said fast, not sure if it's for the snare only, interesting. Yep, slow attack and fast release, killer on drums. Yeah, you know, I, I'm a little amazed about how everybody today uses all kinds of compression and gating and limiting and side chaining and double compression, parallel compression, just like vegetarian, vegan compression. Um, I, I rarely, rarely, I mean, like probably less than 10% of the time, maybe even less than 5% of the time, did I ever compress the drums. 
I don't know if you remember that Melanie record that I played maybe a year or so ago. Um, and people always comment, wow, the drums sound so good on that. I got the drum sound super fast on that. And, uh, and didn't, I don't think I used any compression on those drums at all. I might have used a gate on the kick on one song where I was getting a lot of guitar amp bleed into it. But that's about it. What about vocals or other instruments? Um, it, it depends. But just know that by using a fast attack, you're killing the transients immediately, like in, in milliseconds. So how many instruments can you think of where you want to kill the attack right away? I can't think of any. I'm sure there are some, but I can't think of them right now. Tapco mixers, absolutely. Yeah, they were live mixers, right? Oh, guess what we're going to do in January? Sometime in the first half of January, probably. Um, I got special permission to go over to the Paul Reed Smith showroom here in Los Angeles. They, they, they're at a place, I can't remember the name of the place, but it's like SIR with a bunch of rehearsal stages. And it's near Burbank Airport. And I've been over there a couple of times, at least before. And there are all these huge acts in there. I mean, like, you know, major touring acts go there and rehearse. And PRS has a room over there that's run by a friend of mine. And his name is Wynn Ko Kozak. Uh, Krozak, sorry. Um, or Kozak. No, I know a Chris Kozak. I get their last names confused. His name is Wynn, W-I-N-N, -N, and he loves sailboats. And he's an excellent keyboard player, I might add. And funny enough, because he works for PRS. Anyway, this guy's job is to sit in a room with a hundred of the most gorgeous PRS guitars you've ever seen. He actually, I talked to him a couple hours ago, and he told me that he's waiting for delivery today, a couple of one-offs. Only, you know, like literally he had two guitars custom built, and there's only one like it on the planet um, of each of them. And I said, well, you're welcome to show those when we do our taxi TV, but none of us can afford it. So why don't you show us the stuff we could actually buy? Um, yeah, I actually got a picture of me and Paul Reed Smith. I, I met him at the 2018 or 2019 um, uh, NAMM show. Um, and he's a fan of taxi. I mean, he couldn't have been any nicer. He's like, man, I love your company. Uh, I met him because my friend Wynn hooked me up with a little meet and greet with him. But uh, it's like he was more excited to meet me than I was to meet him. No, it didn't come out right. I was excited to meet him. But he was he was just like effusively nice and, and excited. So that was very cool. Um, yeah, the guitar can be electric, acoustic, uh, ukulele, mandolin, or similar for the Christmas songs. Yeah, it can be anything. Ooh, an Al Schmidt plug-in from Leapwing. What kind? But what is it? I mean, you don't plug it in; it just instantly sounds like Al Schmidt did it. Al Schmidt is awesome. Al Schmidt, R.I.P. Though. <laughs> Parallel compression is crucial on drums, in my opinion. It makes up for the boatload of compression I put on the instrument bust. <laughs> Uh, no, no instrumentals. You got to have lyrics. Let's make that a rule. Let's have some fun. And, and you know, speaking of fun, it could be a funny song. Um, could be a funny song. Could be a serious song. Could be, you know, Rudolph broke his leg tonight. Whatever. I love the CLA plugins. I've got a bunch of them. And I've got to say, they actually work. You know, one of the discussions I see all the time is people going, well, I don't know if it sounds exactly like a real 1176. Um, honestly, I don't think I've ever heard three hardware compressors that ever sounded exactly the same. I had a, a pair of 160s uh, mounted, DBX 160s mounted side by side in a rack, and it had a switch that would let you gang them together to act, you know, like true stereo compressors. Um, those two didn't sound the same. I had uh, a pair of LA-3s 
that were also uh, side by side that you could gang together for, you know, treat them as stereo. But one of them, <clears throat> excuse me, one of them sounded great on electric guitars, dial in the same exact setting with the same guitar, the same preamp, the same channel on the console, everything the same. If I did it on the right hand LA3, it was like, meh, it's okay. I did it on the left hand side, it was dripping honey. There's just something so much better about that one. There's a CLA NS10 reissue. You mean actual, like, NS10 cabinets? Oh, I have seen that. Yeah, it is cabinets, right? I think I saw that in an issue of Sound on Sound or something. Why can't you travel, Andre? Um, health reasons, or are you guys still locked down from crossing the border? You guys love it when we talk gear, don't you? I do too. What can I say? Um, hey, I just recently noticed that Gear Sluts changed their name from Gear Sluts to something else. Can't remember. Apparently, people were offended by the inference. And if they actually knew audio, they you know it had nothing to do with, you know, denigrating the the female gender. Nothing about that. It's all about all of us people, whether we're men or women that love gear, we're just whores for more gear. <laughs> it's a sad, sad, sad addiction. And it costs more than heroin. <laughs> Dimension deadline, let's make it for uh, noon on Monday, noon LA time on Monday. Please make note of that, Liz, if you would kindly. I haven't tried the CLA Mix Hub. I think I might have actually purchased it, but not tried it yet. I knew a punk band in Detroit that wrote a song called Blood for Christmas. Wow. I, I've got to say, I don't really enjoy going to the NAMM show. For like 25 years, Taxi was a member of NAMM. Uh, we were the first company of our ilk to ever get uh, permission to join NAMM and be an actual member. But I don't like crowds. I'm a little antisocial. I know you wouldn't think so because... I do the road rally and stuff, but like when I go to the NAMM show, I wish I could go, not that I'm a huge celebrity, but, you know, to a very, very, very tiny niche in the world, which is basically musicians who want to get record deals and publishing deals and film and TV placements. I'm a bit of a celebrity, just a bit. It hasn't gone to my head, though. Still the same old me. But um, when I go to the NAMM show, it, people come up to me. It's like, Michael, how are you? I don't want to be rude. But what I'd really like to do would be actually turn knobs on that piece of gear and listen intently to the headphones so I can hear out sounds. So I think next time I go, I'm going to get a mask like this, but get one that goes all the way up to my forehead, just has little cutouts for the eyes, so that I can twiddle the knobs. And then when I'm ready to leave, I can do a lap around without the mask. Well, I can't do it without the mask, but you know what I'm saying. Because I don't want to be antisocial. A lot of my good friends go to the NAMM show. But um, I do like turning knobs, what can I say? It is like being addicted to chocolate. Go to see Stephen Slate. You know, I've never met Stephen Slate, although he and I did speak on the phone before the 2018 or 2019 road rally. They were gonna be a sponsor um, and he was pretty adamant that if they sponsored that we had to put him on stage for something. So I talked to him on the phone. Uh, wear a wig? Nah, not my style. Um, anyway, uh, 
he gave me, like after I talked to him on the phone, um, Stephen Slate drums in the box that's like that thick just showed up here one day for me. And I've never bothered. Have you guys ever used them? How are they? Because whatever I've got, you know, would need a bunch of updates. It's from 2018 or 2019 at this point. Yeah, I'm not into crowds. I, I do have mild claustrophobia. Not in an elevator. It's funny. I can get. I can go in an MRI tube or a tiny little elevator, um, but I do. I I didn't know this till like three or four years ago. And my family doctor said, you know, that's a form of claustrophobia, don't you? And I went, no, I had no idea. So apparently, I've got it. Um, So glad you went with Slate. I love the beef. Yeah, John Pearson was telling, John Pearson swears he loves Drummer in Logic Pro. I haven't used it yet. So that's what I'm saying. Why, why should I use Stephen Slate? I also got a free version of, what's the other one? <clears throat> Name another popular drum program everybody seems to use. Easy Drummer, yeah. I've got, and what's the one that's above it? They gave me Easy Drummer years ago, and I played around with it, didn't do anything serious with it. Uh, and then the the one that's above Easy Drummer, um, Superior Drummer. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, they, I've got the you know the high end like full blown version of that, and, and pretty much everything else they make. But I'm not so sure I even need to put that on a hard drive, do I? I mean, Logic has so much stuff that actually sounds good in it. JP, are you still watching? You better be, damn it, because I'm watching you. Watch me. <laughs> um, Superior Drummer, that's it. Logic guys, don't buy drum software. Really, so I should use the Logic Drummer, but load the Tune Track kits. Interesting. Yes, definitely Superior Drummer is by Tune Track. And somebody else told me that they used Groove Agent the other day and they loved it. I had to do something on a, maybe like a 2015 or 2016 laptop a um, couple months ago, and, what, and I didn't want to put Logic on it to do it, so I just used GarageBand, but it had updated to a fairly recent version of GarageBand. I'm blown away. GarageBand of like a year ago does more than I believe Logic did five years ago. GarageBand has really grown up. Only six people have liked the show. Come on, you guys. Hold on. Oops. Oops, oops, oops. I'm not putting this down until you click the like button. <laughs> it's like a hunger strike, kind of. I'm just going to sit here silently and stare at you until you click the damn like button. Look at all this work I'm doing right now. I deserve a like, right? Anyway, um, Mojo likes Groove Agent as well. Yeah, when I tried Drummer, I, I wasn't blown away by the sounds. Um, what's so good about Drummer? <laughs> Liz likes it so much she did it twice. How do I like the ozone plug-in? Do I have that? 
I don't know. Honestly, it's a shame, or as my grandmother would have said, it's a shanda, um, which I think was Yiddish for it's a shame. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I, I am fortunate enough that, you know, sometimes when people sponsor the rally, they send me a free whatever, and um, I just don't have the time. <laughs> Mary can spell Yiddish in Yiddish now. That's funny. Drummer is all about workflow. I don't have a workflow yet. Honestly, I wish they had a tape machine. Well, I do have a tape machine. I think I bought either the Abbey Road or, oh God, what's his name? The guy that worked with Hendrix, the Eddie Kramer tape machine. I don't know. I bought somebody's uh, analog tape machine, which uh, I love it when they say it's really subtle. Which <laughs> It's like the A&A quadrilator I used to have. Uh, you know, it's really subtle. It means it does nothing. If you've got to work that hard to hear it, do you really need it on your project? Yeah, Kramer tape is cool and very affordable. Um, whichever one I got, and I've got relatively good ears. I can't say that I'm, you know, it's 60 some years old, I have the best ears on the block. Um, but, you know, my hearing's pretty good for my age, and I know what I'm looking for because I'm a trained engineer. I went to engineering school. Uh, I've got a hat at home, a little blue and white striped hat and a whistle. Anyway, um, I forget. I think it was one of the tape machines. It might have been the Abbey Road one. I think I've got a couple of them. And I was running it on my mix bus just trying to hear it. And I'm like, do I hear anything different? And then I tried headphones and listened to it a little louder. I don't know. Console One has made a huge difference in my mixes. Can I talk about saturation? Yeah. In, in my day, we, we, we wanted to get rid of it, though. It's funny. Now when I go back and I listen to stuff that I know was done on tape, I can hear it better. Because back then, there was nothing that didn't have it. Everything was done on tape. And now it's not. So I can definitely hear a difference. But um, it's like there's so, you know, don't add top end to that bass. Just, you know, oversaturate, uh, overdrive the front end. Uh, and, and frankly, I've been doing some of that, or I've done some of that over the last year in Logic, and, and I go, I got to say, it actually works. Only the best engineers in the world can hear the Abbey Road tape plug-in. <laughs> oh, man. Another webinar is coming on. It's not even top of the hour, Marion. Get back in your seat, damn it. <laughs> uh, man. Yeah, I always, like, the, when I worked at Criteria, all the guys there, it was really collegial. Uh, it was. Everybody supported everybody. We were all into passing on what we learned and stuff. But there were people. Every now and then, like another engineer from the West Coast or something, or New York would come to Criteria for a month or two to work on a record. And they would quickly start hanging out with us, the staff guys at Criteria. And I would love these guys that, like, oh, yeah, I can hear that. I can hear that 18K on that symbol. No, you can't. Shut up, you liar. <laughs> Bye, Marion. She's in Oklahoma. 
success in the music industry or having an audience who can hear your tape saturation. There you go. I got to say, the last room that I worked in regularly for a five-year stretch um, was a room in Midtown Manhattan that had an SSL 6048. Um, four Pultex, real Pultex, like original Pultex, Pultex that had been recapped. Um, two original uh, LA 2As. I'm talking the, the real stuff, you know, not like we're using the same schematic and building it again, but I'm talking real stuff that, you know, all the solder joints redone, recap and everything. I might be the only guy on the planet that just, I, I don't love Pultex. It's another one of those things like, okay, if I, I mean, how can you go wrong in theory using a Pultec and an LA2? They both got tubes, they're both vintage and a really good bass sound coming out of the bass. Um, honestly, there were times I got better bass sounds using a DBX 160, which was all solid state stuff and not famous for sounding great back in the day when I used it. Now they're like a collector's like, oh no. I broke the the eraser on my pencil. That's a sad day. Um, but Pultec base trick. Pultec base trick is the best use for them. Yeah, but I I would just use like the SSL uh, EQ that was on the channel, and probably the SSL compressor on the channel. And I always liked the way that sounded better. If not, I would use like a DBX 160 or 165. Melinda Neal, click the like button. Thank you, Melinda. Yeah, 160 is highly underappreciated back in the day. I'm telling you, I, I apparently wasn't cool enough or smart enough to like, always like like what the the trendy kids liked you know i just liked what i used and, and it sounded good and i'm not a guy who worked on theory a lot you know i, I didn't like well you know it's got you know 0 0.003 thd at whatever frequency i don't give a crap let's just plug it in turn the knob all the way to the right then back it off and go eh, that sounds pretty good right there um that's how i worked and i ended up using LA3s all the time, DBX160s all the time. Had rooms, uh, there were times I didn't use my LA2s because I liked the LA3s better. They did have the same optical driver in them, I'll give you that, but they didn't have tubes in the threes. <sighs> Michael has the most knobs in the background. Yeah, I would like to do a record on that console. What about Fairchild? I've got a very close friend whose name I can't say um, who's got uh, a Fairchild. And I don't think he uses it that often, but I will say that um, when we were over at his house for New Year's Eve four, five, six years ago, and he asked my daughter, Hannah, have you written anything new? And she played a song she wrote called Suicide. And he said, get in here. And we just sat in his tiny little control room about the size of me and this console right here. Uh, and he ran her vocal through, um, I think it was just that. I don't think he ran it through any outboard EQ or anything. All I know is it sounded really good. Um, I'm Mike. I'm not actually in a room. This this is a green screen. <laughs> they did have a sub. This is the room. Um, this is uh, Westlake Studio. Uh, that was the day I was over there for whatever reason, and they let me listen to Michael Jackson's Thriller album sitting at that console. I actually took that picture with my phone after I got done drooling on the console. It sounded so good in that room. And for those of you who haven't heard me tell this story before. Um, they had a pair of JBL 4311s mounted slightly behind the console and in the ceiling pointing down at the floor. And I'm like, okay, I've worked in a lot of rooms and I've engineered, you know, with a lot of like 
famous people and stuff, but I've never seen that. What's the deal? It's because Michael Jackson had a bad back and he would come in after doing a vocal and he would just flat out lay on the floor and look up at the ceiling and wanted speakers blowing down on him. Uh, yes, it was thrilling, Ken. Um, gerbils? Or is that Goebbels? <laughs> the, the Nazi war criminal or, or the small furry animal? Which one are you talking about? Um, and he, Michael Jackson also had 4311s in the vocal booth so that between takes he could lay on the floor and listen. Interesting. Um, you're watching on your cracked phone. Oh, don't make excuses for the fact that my green screen is so good. Come on, look. If you look carefully, my hair it looks like worms crawling up there. Um, anyway, so going back to a point that I made, woo, I need to stop now. Our time is up. Um, I, I can I honestly can't say that I've been in a situation where I could a b any of the plugins that I've gotten from Waves and a few other places um, against hardware, uh, but it doesn't matter. Just use what you like. Use what sounds good. Does it have to sound exactly like an original 1176? No, because no two 1176s ever sounded like the other one. So that's my point. Just use what sounds good for you. Turn the knob till it sounds pretty. Anyway, um, so that's it, guys. Uh, JBLs are referred to as Goebbels? Really? Kind of like sandpaper on your ears, but I know the 4311s well. I could make a good sounding record on those. Um, it has been nice to hang out with you all. It's fun. I, I miss not doing as many quarantinis as we used to. But the road rally got in the way. 2021, my favorite thing about 2021, um, I got to see a lot of my daughters. Um, two long trips to Israel this year and actually got to spend more time with them than I thought I would, so that was really nice. Can't believe our daughter Hannah's now lived outside of the U.S. for seven, maybe going on eight years already. Um, and uh, our daughter Gabriella has been over there for three or four years, and they just love life over there. So it was really nice to see more of them than I thought. Um, did we end up paying for a lot of meals at restaurants? Yes. <laughs> when we were over there, first couple of weeks, we didn't have a, a working kitchen, so we ate out for all meals. It got expensive. Anyway, uh, thanks for hanging out. See you guys on Monday. Don't forget... Uh, we will send out an email over the weekend and then a reminder on Monday. But uh, the deal is that you need to get uh, your tushies and gear and get the music. Um, Liz will post something on Facebook or Twitter, one of those Instagram things, <laughs> and tell you what to do. We will give you instructions. All you have to worry about right now is just recording a new original Christmas song. Um, none of that public domain stuff. Um, and do just a guitar vocal or a keyboard vocal. And if you want to throw in a click track or a shaker to keep time, that's okay. You could use sleigh bells to keep time. <laughs> All right, you guys, talk to you soon. Have a great weekend, and I will see you on Monday, right back here for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Bye-bye. Go, Keith LeBrant, go.